Spurgeon uh, preached on this text, and he said, I need to admit that uh, I don't always give thanks. In, in fact, um, he, was, um, he stated, I've not always found it easy to practice this duty. I confess to my shame. When he was uh, hurting one day in extreme pain, um, he had a friend who came to him, and, and the friend said, have you thanked God for this? And Spurgeon replied, I desired to be patient and be thankful to recover. <laughs> and Spurgeon's friend said, but in everything give thanks, not after it's over, but while you're still in it, and perhaps when you are unable to give thanks for the severe pain, it will cease. And Spurgeon said, I believe there was much force in that good advice. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you. I found some phrases about thanksgiving. This was in Christianity Today a few years ago. It said, this thanksgiving, I'm thankful. See if you relate with any of this. I'm thankful there are twice as many congressmen as, and half as many doctors. Excuse me. I'm thankful there aren't twice as many congressmen and half as many doctors. I'm thankful that grass doesn't grow through snow, necessitating winter mowing as well as shoveling. <laughs> this is obviously somebody who doesn't live on the mountain. Who has, what's, what's grass? Is that that pot stuff that they talk about? No, no. <laughs> I'm thankful that there are only 24 available hours each day for TV programming. I'm thankful that civil servants aren't less civil. I'm thankful that teenagers ultimately will have children who will become teenagers. <laughs> uh, this was uh, written, by the way, at Thanksgiving. I'm thankful I'm not a turkey. <laughs> that was a literal. <laughs> they still may be, but whatever. That, I'm thankful that houses still cost more than cars. <laughs> I'm thankful that the space available for messages on t-shirts and bumpers is limited. <laughs> I'm thankful that liberated women whose husbands take them for granted don't all scream at the same time. Okay, you didn't get it, but that's okay. I'm thankful that snow covers the unraked leaves. I'm thankful that hugs and kisses don't add weight or cause cancer. I'm thankful that record players and radios and TV sets and washers and mixers and lights can be turned off. And I'm thankful that no one can turn off the moon and the stars. Some things to be thankful for. And then I found another one and said, I'm thankful. I'm thankful, and then listen to this perspective. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you. All circumstances, it says. It doesn't say just a few. So listen to this one. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little too snug because it means I have enough to eat. <laughs> I'm thankful for all the complaining I hear about the government because it means that I have freedom of speech. Amen. Think about that one these last couple of weeks. I'm thankful for the alarm that goes off in the early morning hours because it means that I am alive. <laughs> I'm thankful for the teenager who is not doing dishes but is watching TV because that means he is at home and not on the streets. <laughs> I'm thankful for the lawn that needs mowing, windows that need cleaning, and gutters that need fixing because it means I have a home. I'm thankful for weariness at the end of the day because it means I have been capable of working hard. And I'm thankful for the parking spot I find at the far end of the parking lot because it means I am capable of walking and that I have been blessed with transportation. I am thankful. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you in Christ Jesus. Notice that is not an invitation. In fact, as we look at the, diff the three different statements that we've been looking at the last three weeks, it said rejoice always, pray continually, and give thanks in all circumstances. Those are not invitations, they are commands. They're instructions that God has given us. By the way, we're in the middle of a series on evaluation. We're evaluating ourselves, we're evaluating our church, we eva and, and as a part of that today, we're trying to say, how thankful are we? How thankful are you? And so um, the, the, this statement here, it's a command. It's God's will for us to give thanks in all circumstances. Incidentally, have you ever asked God for his, what his will is? 
Lord, please show me your will. Lord, I, I want to know your will, maybe in a specific time, a specific time experience you're going through. Well, guess what? Right here in these verses are God's will. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. If you want to know God's will, start doing those three things. Rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. There are a couple of ways that we might uh, interpret this command, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. First, it may mean it's simply God's will for you to give thanks in all things. No matter what's happening, God's will is give thanks. And notice the word there is in, not for. Right? So you stub your toe and you say, thank you for that stub toe, right? for how much it hurts, right? Although, if you, it, it, there may be some reason to thank God for that stub toe, but that's another. Just the fact that, the fact that you have the ability to feel the pain that you have the, the ability to recognize uh, uh, and, and, and actually get up and walk and move around and stub your toe. Anyways, there's all kinds of parts to Thanksgiving. And so the first way of interpreting this is God's will is interpreted as God wants us giving thanks in all situations, all circumstances, no matter what's happening. Give thanks. There's a second way of looking at it as well. Both have merit. Both are meaningful. Both are valuable to us. And the second way is you can give thanks for all things because those things represent the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. Now that one's a little harder, isn't it? Because if life is going tough for you and, and, and it's God's will to say these experiences that you're going through right now are part of his will for you, sometimes we don't want that will, do we? Sometimes we don't want the hard time. We don't want the difficulty. And yet, the word has told us it's those difficulties that, that strengthen us and enable us to grow and build us up and that God has promised to be there with us and life is going to have its pain. But in the middle of that, God's doing something to accomplish his purpose for us. It's Romans 8, 28, that God's working all the things together for good for those who love you and are called according to his purposes. That God really cares so much that, that even though we may not want this will, we may not want this experience, we may not want this pain, but it's an acknowledgement. Give thanks because God's will is being accomplished in my life. Here's an interesting thought I had for this week. Do you know what the opposite of giving thanks is? The opposite of giving thanks. It's grumbling. It's griping. It's complaining. <laughs> it's it's Philippians 2, 14 to 16. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. The opposite of giving thanks is complaining and grumbling, grousing and griping, negative talk. Talk. Don't you enjoy it when somebody grumbles and gripes? <sighs> you know, somebody complains to you and it just feels good, doesn't it? Just lifts your spirit, encourages your heart, moves you to better action, right? <laughs> Not grumbling, griping, the opposite of thanksgiving. And so Paul in the word of God says, give thanks in all circumstances, no matter what's going on in your life, regardless of the experience you're facing, give thanks in the middle of that. Because none of us really like grumblers. The Rotary Club here in Crestline has um, a four-way test that they operate under. First, is it the truth? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendships? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? But the Crestline Lake Gregory Rotary Club has added a fifth. And that's, by the way, called the four-way test. They've added a fifth one, and it's no whining. <laughs> what did you say? You betcha. You betcha. <laughs> Thanksgiving is a command and grumbling and murmuring and complaining and whining is not God's command for us, but it's quite the opposite of giving thanks. I guess the question we have to kind of look at, though, this morning is, how do you give thanks in all circumstances? 
How do you give thanks standing at the graveside of somebody you love? How, how do you give thanks when you're sitting there in the doctor's office and the doctor's telling you stuff you definitely don't want to hear? <laughs> Some of us were talking this morning about what's happening as we age. And if I could remember what we said, I would share it with you. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you are laughing because you have the same memory issues I do. <laughs> but, but seriously, what happens as you start you know, being in a conversation and you can't remember what you were talking about? What happens if you're driving someplace and you don't remember where you were trying to go? What happens if you're speaking to somebody that you know and you can't remember their name? And, and the, the struggle with, with memory. Yeah. Can you give thanks? And how do you give thanks when you're dealing with the aging of a body? Because we, we're all going there, right? Uh, I, even those, those of you who are young, <laughs> we're all aging. We're all growing to some point. The body is in its process of, of literally dying, isn't it? And as we go through that process and as we experience those different things, how do you give thanks? How do you give thanks? <laughs> There's a good one. How do you give thanks in the middle of the night when the dog won't stop barking? <laughs> could, could I encourage you that Philippians 4 may have an instruction for us when it says this, finally, verse 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. How do you give thanks for in the middle of all circumstances? You need to think about something that's good, pure, honorable, just, excellent, praiseworthy, as Paul's saying. You need to work on your thinking so that you can, excuse me, give thanks in all circumstances. Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Bell Graham, um, some of you don't realize it uh, unless if you're watching the funeral uh, for Billy Graham, you know that uh, his children were not all perfect. <clears throat> Franklin, in fact, was one of the most rebellious. And, 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 and there were challenges that the, that the Grahams had <laughs> as they were doing their ministry around the world and also trying to deal with their teenage children. Ruth found herself sometimes worrying intensely about her kids. One night while they were abroad in another country, she woke up suddenly in the middle of the night and she was extremely worried, almost having a panic attack about her, one of her sons. And it could have been Franklin. The worry surged like an electric shock through her body. She lay there in bed, she tried to pray but she suffered from an anxiety that was just growing and intensifying. One fear added on to another. She started thinking about the things that her son was involved in. She looked at the clock. It was around three in the morning. She was exhausted, yet she was unable to go back to sleep. And suddenly laying there in that bed, the Lord spoke to her. And here's what he said. Quit studying the problems and start studying the promises. That would hit home if you're laying there in the middle of the night having an anxiety attack and God speaks to you and says, quit studying the problem and start studying the promises. Ruth turned on the light, jumped out of bed, got her Bible out. And the first verse she came to were these verses from Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7. And as she read, she suddenly realized that the missing ingredient in her prayers had been what? Thanksgiving. In everything, here's what Philippians 4, 6, 7 says, in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving make your requests known to God. She put down her Bible and she began worshiping Jesus. She later wrote this about the experience. I began to thank God for giving me this one I love so dearly in the first place. 
I even thanked him for the difficult spots which had taught me so much. And you know what happened? It was as if someone turned on the light in my mind and heart and the little fears and worries that had been nibbling away in the darkness like mice and cockroaches hurriedly scurried for cover. That was when I learned that worship and worry cannot live in the same heart. They're mutually exclusive. Folks, thanksgiving is a choice. This week... Um, some of you know that I have the responsibility of paying the payroll for the for the coffee shop and that um, sometimes it is really 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 tight and uh, recently we've had some more tax bills come in and then it turned out we had a fourteen hundred dollar bill for the newspaper that I didn't know about and, and we're barely getting by week to week and we have fourteen hundred dollar bill oh lord so we paid the $1,400 bill at the beginning of the week, and I'm looking, and that's on Monday. I'm looking, I have no idea how we're going to make payroll on Friday morning. And I get to write the checks on Thursday, and I have to sit down and do the finances. And there's already been enough times where in order to make payroll, Debbie and I have added money in, sometimes significant dollars just to try to get payroll. And, and, and I'm, this week I'm, I'm looking there, and I'm looking at our checking account, and I'm saying, Lord, it's not going to happen. And I don't know how we're going to do this. And I could feel my stress level going up, the blood pressure, everything. I mean, I was, I was starting to feel some of that anxiety that you feel like, how are we going to do payroll? I mean, I can't have eight people down there, young people, waiting and expecting to get their check and not have the money to give them their check. Or I'm going to pick, okay, four of you will pay, the rest of you, uh, can you just wait? Yeah, I, I, I remember a day in a school that we had, a Christian school that we had in, um, in Scottsdale. And we came to a time that, that some situations had happened. I don't remember the details, know what, what went on. But I went to our teachers and I said, teachers, um, we've had some issues and we need to try to deal with the funding and I, I, I need to hold off paying you. One of the fathers of one of those teachers came in and started cussing me out. And, and uh, okay, she, she's she's a married young lady, and yet you're, <laughs> and yet dad's here just just cussing me out, and you have to by law da da da, and, and it like went on from there. So I was uh, this week as I'm sitting there thinking about how are we going to make payroll, I had pictures of that moment. <laughs> oh great, how many dads are going to come talk to me on Friday morning? This is not going to be pretty, and just the stress level started to intensify, and then I remember I'm supposed to preach on Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> thank you God for the stress I'm feeling <laughs> but I tried okay look if we're going to do this and we're called to give thanks in all circumstances regardless of what's happening I just need to go ahead and thank you God thank you that you're here with me thank you you're going to somehow work this out thank you that you care thank you that you understand thank you that this is in your hands and I, I'm just going to give you thanks Lord and also at the same time pray that you'll somehow work it out and what's really amazing is, is that when I went to do the payroll on Thursday night and I sat down and I figured up all the numbers, we were able to cover payroll with $9.90 left in the checking account. <laughs> I don't know how we're paying the IRS the 800 that they didn't take out, but I'm thankful they didn't take it out. <laughs> Okay, we had we had commit submitted a payment for eight hundred dollars to actually to the I think it was the franchise tax board. I don't remember which one it was. And he's one of the tax people, right? And we had submitted that, and for some reason, um, either we didn't have the right pin number, we didn't have something else, so they didn't take eight hundred dollars out. Thank you, Jesus, that eight hundred dollars was still there, so we could make payroll. Anybody have $800 wants to help with that this week? I'm more than welcome. So that when the IRS asks for it, it's there. Um, I'm saying there's crises that come up. There's circumstances that we're facing. And the challenge that we have is to give thanks to God in all circumstances. And Thanksgiving, folks, is not a choice. It's, it's not something we say, you know, well, will I give thanks today or not? Excuse me, Thanksgiving is a choice we decide whether we are going to say thank you we choose 
whether we'll have a heart that says, God, I appreciate you. God, I thank you. God, I'm going to look for something in the middle of this that's going to give you thanks. It, and then here's the really cool thing. When you give God thanks and you're anxious and worried and stressed out, maybe depressed and discouraged, do you know that when you give God thanks, that's when the anxiety can actually go away? It's in the act of giving thanks, the choice of thanking God, the choice of putting your attention on him rather than the circumstances, that the circumstances lose their power over you. One, one gentleman said that we have a thermometer and medicine and thanksgiving. He says, is it a thermometer or is it medicine? A thermometer simply measures, right? Measures what whether you have a temperature or something like that. But the thermometer can't do anything for you. But medicine can actually heal, can actually take the fever or whatever illness you're struggling with. Medicine can take it away. Guess what? Thanksgiving is, not, is a medicine for the soul. Psychologists believe we're born with a preset happiness level. Did you know that? Some of us are some of us are melancholy. Some of us are sanguine. Some of us are hyperactive. You know, and all right. Some of us you know are happy about everything. Some of us are sad about everything. And that, that that's a preset thing. So that see there you can if you're a person who's always depressed and always anxious and 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 always upset and always negative, you should just be saying, "Oh, thank you, God. That's the way you made me." Seriously, the psychologist though in evaluating this, uh, Dr. Robert Emerson of the University of California, Davis, demonstrated there's one way to adjust our pre-programmed inborn personality settings. It's by developing the habit of consciously giving thanks in the midst of whatever circumstances we face. Where did I hear that before? A psychologist has learned that there's this incredible tool that can change even the way we think we've been programmed and that that way of doing that is to give thanks in all circumstances. He just didn't add the next phrase, for this is the will of the Lord for you in Christ Jesus. Here in their, in their study, it said, we discovered scientific proof that when people regularly engaged in the systematic cultivation of gratitude, they experience a variety of measurable benefits psychological, physical, and interpersonal. You actually benefit, and scientists have now proven that giving thanks, having an attitude of thanksgivings, actually makes a difference with your psyche. He goes on, Emmons says, the evidence on gratitude contradicts the widely held view that all people have a set point of happiness that cannot be reset by any no means. You can actually reset yourself by giving thanks. You're anxious. You're depressed, you're discouraged, you're upset, you're angry, you're lonely, you're broken, you're hurting. And giving thanks can actually reset you. I appreciate how Warren Wearsby said, he said, to live a life of praise is to overcome criticism and complaining to stop competing against others and comparing ourselves with them. It means to be grateful in and for everything and really believe that God is working all things together for good. Ephesians, Paul said it this way in Ephesians 5, Therefore do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. What's the best way to sing is to sing thanksgiving. Some of you are old enough. Um, those of you who are uh, born after 1985 won't know this at all. Okay, but some of you are old enough to remember missionary Benjamin Weir. Benjamin was a Presbyterian missionary, he and his wife in, in Lebanon. His wife Carol and he served together there for nearly 30 years. And you might remember Benjamin along with, I believe it was Terry Andrews and f five or six other people were all uh, taken captive on the streets of Beirut in 1984. 
Uh, the kidnapping was done by an Islamic fundamentalist group um, uh, that later became the roots for the group known as Hezbollah. He was freed 16 months later in exchange for um, some weapons, and some of you remember the Iran-Contra affair. But, but Weir, uh, after being kidnapped and after being released, um, was meeting with and interviewed almost immediately afterwards and, and, and asked, how did you spend your time? There was actually a portion of his time of something like 10 or 12 months where he was actually in solitary confinement. So imagine, no contact with other people, occasion with his captors, and completely alone in a, in a room uh, during this time. And they said, how did, how did you handle it? Incidentally, if anyone wants to check out this story, um, Weir wrote a book called Hostage Bound, Hostage Free. In the interview, when he was asked how he spent his time, do you know what he said? His answer <laughs> really threw the reporters, because he simply said, counting my blessings. I spent my time counting my blessings. What do you mean by that? Ble blessings? He said, yes. Some days I got to take a shower. Sometimes there were some vegetables in my food. And I could always be thankful for the love of my family. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of the Lord for you. And that's what we are learned that no matter how bad it was, the thing that would help carry him through was not to focus on how bad it was, but to find something to give thanks for. And so just to remember, I have a family back home that I love and loves me, and he'd give thanks for them. He'd give thanks for the fact that he had a God that cared about him, even though he was in this horrible situation, didn't know he would even survive. He could still give thanks for God. And he found that it was that counting his blessings, giving thanks every single day, and whatever was going on, that that's what carried him through. <clears throat> I found an interesting thing as I was looking through the scripture this week on giving thanks. As we prepare to receive communion in a few moments, have you looked closely at what, how this description in the Gospels is of communion. You remember, I'm sure, that um, Jesus set up communion as we take it uh, at, at what's referred to oftentimes as the Last Supper. Jesus set up communion at, at a part of a Passover meal. And in the middle of that Passover meal, he changes things that have been hundreds of years in a, in a tradition that's been, that's maintained and many places still maintain that tradition, excuse me, that tradition to this day. The whole Passover of the lamb and the meat, eating of the Passover lamb and, and the whole process there and the, the drinking of the cups and the various blessings that take place and breaking of bread and all that. But near the end of that, as a part of that meal, Jesus, and, and this is recorded both in Matthew and Mark and uh, in the gospel, says, in Matthew 26 says this, then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Now, that's a very familiar phrase, isn't it? Most of us probably could, could almost quote something like that. When, when Jesus um, was doing communion, he took the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, this is my blood poured out for you. And we said, yeah, yeah, amen, thank you, Jesus, right? But, but stop and think about this fact for a moment. What is Jesus thanking for? He's turned to his Father in heaven. He's taken the cup He's taken the cup, much larger one. They would have shared it and with one another. But he's taken this cup, and he's going to, and this is a new moment in the meal. It's not something that they've normally done. And, he's, and he says, thank you, God. Thank you, Father, for this cup. This cup that is my blood that is going to be poured out 
for the sins of the world, for their forgiveness. Thank you, God. What is Jesus doing? Jesus is thanking his father for the privilege of sacrificing his life in a cruel, horrible, painful kind of way on a cross. Before he goes to the cross, before he'll agonize in that garden saying, Lord, if there's any other way, before he all does that, he says, Father, thank you. Thank you for the cup. Thank you for my blood that's going to be poured out for the sins of the world. Thank you, Father. Do you hear how intense, how almost crazy that is that Jesus, he, he's saying, I'm thankful that I'm going to be able to pour my blood out for all these people throughout history. It's an intense moment. This is not just grape juice. This is not just a glass of wine. But Jesus says, this is my blood which is being poured out for you so that you can be forgiven. Thank you, Father, for allowing me. Thank you for this blood that I'm about to give. Thank you that I get to be sacrificed. Oh, my. Yeah, he'll be challenged. He'll fight one more battle with evil. He'll pray for some other way. But this, this is the blood of the covenant. And Jesus is thankful for his blood that is being poured out. Oh my. Do we understand? Do we comprehend the intensity of what Jesus has done for us? Or do we, like the children with their breakfast, take things just way too for granted? It's a fairly new hymn, I think 15, 10, 15 years old, In Christ Alone. It's referred to as a modern hymn. In Christ alone do we have our grace. It's in Christ alone that we're forgiven. In Christ alone we are able to handle the challenges and heartaches and difficulties and stresses of life. 